Praise God. Welcome to Father's Our Digital Church tonight. General teaching Saturday night. My name is Pastor Leslie Hessel, for those that do not know me. Um, it's been quite an interesting little ride this last week. Apologies for my voice. Be battling a little bit of a dose of flu, but it's, uh, we, we victorious in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, we are healed and we walk in that perfect health. We will not submit to that which the devil tries to afflict us with. And therefore we decree and declare God's word upon our lives and we trust him for, for his victory. So apologies once again just for the little bit of croakiness. But nevertheless, that does not mean that we're not going to preach the word with power and with might. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together once again, to be able to study your word. And Father God, to learn that which you have for us this evening. Lord, we know that faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. And Father, therefore I pray right now that every ear is anointed to receive that which the word has spoken. I pray also that you anoint my mouth, anoint my thoughts. Father God, let me hear the spirit accurately and communicate accurately that which the spirit has to say tonight, Lord. And Father, thank you that it falls on fertile ground. It will take root, grow, develop, become strong, Father God. Bear Bear forth much fruit in the life of the era. Let them be delivered and set free in Jesus' name. And we bless you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I've got a scripture on my heart tonight which I wanted to minister on. And that is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll read from verse 1 through to verse 5. But the, the verses I really want to minister on is verse 4 and 5. Which talks about our weaponry in the spirit and the fact that we do not have, we do not fight with carnal weapons, but we fight with spiritual weapons. And, and, uh, as a title, I battled a little bit to decide what to, to title this particular message. But I think, um, how, a good title would be how to fight. <laughs> okay. How to fight in the spirit. How to, how to come against the onslaught of the devil. Because I think many of us fight and, and we, we basically face struggles. We face opposition. We face things. And, uh, you know, if we had to fight in the natural, in the flesh, it'll be easy. Take up a weapon, take up a gun, take up a knife, take up a sword, take up whatever weapon you've got. And that becomes an offensive weapon. You can attack and you can hurt and maim and kill and destroy. But in the case of the spirit, you're fighting with things that you cannot see. And you're fighting with things that are not in the natural realm per se. So therefore, you have to fight with a different weaponry and a different style and a different method. And therefore, we need to understand how to fight those fights. And tonight, I think what I want to do is just basically give you some insights from my personal life, from my personal experiences, and how I conduct and how I fight these particular things. And I'm hoping it will encourage you and help you and, and be able to teach you a thing or two. So... Let's go then to the scripture. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible tonight, and I want you to turn with me if you have your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to read from verse 1. And it says, Now I myself, Paul, beseech you by the gentleness and consideration of Christ himself, I who am lowly enough, so they say, when among you face to face, but bold, fearless, and outspoken to you when I am absent from you, I entreat you when I do come to you that I may not be driven to such boldness as I intend to show towards those who, those few suspect us of acting according to the flesh on the low level of worldly motives and as if invested with only human powers. So let me just pause there after verse 2 and just make a comment quickly. Um, in this particular passage, I think Paul is defending his ministry. And uh, he's been accused of that when he writes letters, they're strong and bold and you know, to the point and he addresses his people and there's an, uh, obviously some kind of aggression and boldness in the way he expresses himself versus when he's actually there physically in, 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 in bodily form. And uh, he says that, listen, <coughs> when I'm there in bodily physical form, he's showing humbleness and meekness and not necessarily the same aggression and boldness he does in writing. So the guys are sort of like accusing him of a double standard here. And uh, he's trying to defend that. At the same time, he also highlights in verse 2 that, listen, um, we're not just here in lowly carnal weaponry of the flesh. You know, that's not what we deal with. We've got powers that are beyond just this, which is of the flesh. And that is where we are going tonight. That's what I want us to have a look at tonight. So, so let's continue reading. So in verse 3, it says, For though we walk or live in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. Okay, so in other words, he's just now putting it out there. Listen, guys. Yes, we are in the bodily form. Yes, we are in flesh. Okay, but you've got to understand that we do not fight with mere carnal weapons. We're fighting with, with a lot more than that. Listen to this again. For though we walk or live in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh. All right, and use, using mere human weapons. Now in verse 4, listen. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not physical. Weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Now I want you to listen to that tonight. In verse 4 then it tells me, first and foremost, my weapons are not carnal. All right, They're not weapons of, of flesh and blood. They are not weapons that are physical. They are different. They are weapons that are coming out of the area of the spirit. And they mighty before God. So therefore, if you look at some of the translations when you read this particular passage, if you look at the Message Bible or the, the Passion Translation or any of those, you'll find that there's quite an uh, intense description when it comes to this particular verse. Because they, they refer to these weapons being powered by God Himself through the Holy Spirit. So these weapons are therefore um, God-inspired, god empowered all right so they way beyond the the capabilities or that which the the flesh can offer or provide and then he says and these weapons are there for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds okay now that word stronghold is, is referred to in some some translations again as a fortress it is a place where uh, you are behind a barrier you are basically it's fortified into a structure where you are you've got um, protection against outside against outside forces that are coming against you but yet it says that these weapons are powerful to overthrow these strongholds because obviously these strongholds are not necessarily strongholds that are good ones they could be strongholds that are bad, like habits, uh, the devil coming into your life and tormenting you in certain areas and uh, causing you to not be able to get the victory in certain areas. Simple ones, drug abuse, alcohol, smoking, uh, pornography, etc. The devil can create strongholds in your life that <clears throat> you battle to penetrate and get the victory over. Yet, he says, these weapons, these spiritual weapons, are well able to overcome these strongholds in your life and my life as individuals. But further than that, these weapons also allow you and I to be victorious in our community, in our surrounding areas, in our nation, etc. So these weapons are not just limited to me and my life and my spiritual well-being. These weapons are there to be able to conduct warfare in the area of the spirit to be able to overcome the devil. Now, I want you to understand something very clearly tonight. I need you to understand the, the, the constructs and the definition of authority in scripture. The Bible makes it clear to us that in, uh, I think it's Luke 10, 19, somewhere around there, the Bible talks about the fact that when Jesus went to the cross and, and he was resurrected, he came back, he said, I have given all power unto you, okay, over the enemy. All right, over Satan. So therefore, you and I have been given authority and power over the works of the enemy and anything that the enemy can do. So, and that that authority is is basically um, non-negotiable. It's there for you and I. And the way that you and I appropriate it or bring it into our life is by faith. Okay, we believe God is real. God exists according to Hebrews eleven six. God exists. There's no doubt about that. And because God exists, He is the ultimate authority, according to Romans 13. So He has all authority. He is the all, all authority of one. He is the one that created everything, and there's nothing that is not that exists that has not been created by Him. And therefore, because of that, He has authority over those things, including the devil, including creation, and everything else that goes with it. He has that authority. Now he comes and he says, I have now given you authority. Jesus delegates that authority unto you and I to now have authority over the devil, okay, over his works and over these strongholds. Now, if you and I have that authority, it means that we can, with that invested authority in us, we have the power to walk in that authority. So now how do you enforce that authority? How do you get the devil to listen to you and to do what you are needing to get done in a specific domain or area. If there's a certain onslaught in your life in a specific area, how do you overcome? How do you deal with that? All right. And how do you, how do you exercise these things? And that's really what I want to try and get into tonight to be able to, to help you to be able to live the life that Christ has paid for, for you and I. Then in verse five, it says, in as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. So, here Paul tells me now, in verse 4, he describes the weapons as not being carnal, but being spiritual. He 
describes to me that these weapons are empowered by God. So they're inspired by him and they are empowered by him and we can walk in that. And then he says those weapons are used to overthrow strongholds. Okay. Now, just to conclude that thing on strongholds quickly, by the way, we need to create strongholds of truth in our lives. Okay. In other words, what I mean by that is the standards that God sets. In other words, let's talk about healing. It says, by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. First Peter 2.24, Isaiah 53.5, etc. He said he sent his word and he healed them. He says in James, call the elders to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So we have got no doubt whatsoever that God has set the standard that he wants you and I to walk in perfect health. All right. So because he wants us to walk in perfect health, that is something that is mine because the word says so. And because Jesus paid the price for it. So I believe that without a shadow of a doubt. I've got no doubt whatsoever not even the slightest that God wants us to walk in perfect health. And we need to receive that health. When the devil comes and he attacks, like with this flu, we choose to put the word first place. Immediately when the onslaught comes, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Father, I thank you right now that this thing cannot take root. It will not take root and it will not uh, put me down. By the way, I have not been to bed and I will not go to bed because I'm fighting this thing in Jesus' name. So therefore, but in Jesus' name, it, I, I'm overcome. I'm overcoming in the spirit. I'm fighting it with every fiber of my being. There is no ways I'm going to go and capitulate and go lie under a blank, go to bed and go to sleep. No. Some of you might say, but that's a wise thing to allow this thing to, 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 um, storm itself out in my life and deal with whatever. Yeah, that's, that's your choice. Okay. I choose not to. I'm going to just bulldoze right through it because I believe by all, in the word of God and the word of God is true. So. So there we have that stronghold. So you set up a stronghold in your life that I have and can walk in perfect health. That is a stronghold in my life, but it's a positive stronghold. It's a stronghold built on truth. Okay. And that is what we have to get into our lives. Those are the fortress, a fortress that when the devil comes to attack, he hits that fortress or stronghold in my life of truth, and he cannot penetrate it. Why? Because in Romans chapter 12 and verse uh, uh, 11, I think it is, it said, we overcome the devil by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. All right, so we know that we can overcome that, and we do overcome through that particular blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So we can walk in that knowledge, and we can walk in that reality, and we can walk in that truth. It forms a stronghold in our life that the devil cannot penetrate. But there's also strongholds that the devil has put into place in our lives that we are battling to penetrate and we are battling to get the victory over. And that's where we are going tonight. And that's what we are discussing tonight. All right. So having looked at that then, and understanding that in verse five, then Paul now says, in as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets up against the true knowledge of God. So, the real battle, the real war is going on up here. Okay, this is where the real battle uh, exists. Because it is in your intellect and your mind and your logic is where the devil attacks you. He says, oh, but that's not true. It's not really like that. He did that to Adam and Eve. He tried to do that to Jesus, um, etc. So he's always coming, did God say, is it really like this? Um, and he tests. He tests the word. He tests. And he comes against and he makes you want to doubt. And because of that, he then tries to penetrate our defenses. Okay. So, yeah, then Paul makes it very clear that, that anything that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, against what we are taught in Scripture, we need to take that thing captive, cast it down, and not even entertain it for one single second. All right. We see, and we lead thought and purpose away captive into obedience to Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So we have to, it's a discipline that you and I need to, to bring into, into being. So the question now is, if we are, if we understand strongholds and we start to understand most of the strongholds are in our mind and we understand that those, uh, the, the war we're fighting is against the lies that the devil brings and contradicts, tries to contradict the word of God and tries to get us to believe in the contradiction rather than in the truth. How do we overcome that now? How do we deal that? And in the book of Ephesians, then, the Bible talks about the, the armor uh, that we have in God. In Ephesians chapter 6. And it talks about the armor that we have. And I want us to just go through to Ephesians chapter 6. 
And I want us to read from verse, um, verse 13. Or maybe in verse 12. It says, for, no, <laughs> let's back up to verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, the armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully to stand up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. Okay, so there, strategies and deceits of the devil. So he tries to confuse, he lies, he brings words that are contradictory to the word of God against the word of God. For we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. There we get a repetition of what Paul said earlier in the book of Corinthians. Contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly and spiritual supernatural sphere. Verse 13, Therefore put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. Stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins and having put on the breastplate of integrity and the moral rectitude of right standing with God. And having shod your feet in the preparation to face the enemy with a firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of, of peace. Verse 16. Lift up over all the covering shield of faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword with which the spirit wields, which is the word of God. Pray at all times, on every occasion, every season in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in, <clears throat> in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. And pray also for me, and I'll pause there. So yeah, Paul is describing the whole armor of God, right? But the Bible encourages me to take up the whole armor. Now I want you to Get a visual of this whole thing. Use your sanctified imagination if you can. And visualize before you a, a soldier that has got on the full armor. He's got the helmet. He's got the breastplate. He's got the shield, the sword. He's a uh, belt around his waist. Um, uh, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, etc. So you can visualize the whole armor all over this person. All right. Now. I want you to have a look at that. Now, normally when, when we, when anybody, okay, goes and is involved in some kind of conflict and, and, and going into war and having to deal with things, your weaponry is made up of two main components. You've got the weaponry that you can use as an offensive weapon. Like in this case, the only offensive weapon I can see in the whole armor of God is the sword of the spirit, which the Bible says is the word of God. We see that in verse 17. And so the sword is the word of God, all right? And we also pictures in scripture where it talks about the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth and sharper than any other two-edged sword. So this, the word of God is referred to and, and, and uh, compared to a sword often in scripture. So you see the sword of the spirit, which is an offensive weapon. It's there, sharp edges, sharp point can uh, jab and, and stick, it can cut, it can slice. And then you see the other components that's spoken about here. And the rest of the armor, the breastplate, the helmet, the shield, everything is a defensive component in the armory. So in other words, that protects, okay? So there's more in the protection than there is in the offensive, all right? So the offensive is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but the rest is, is actually defensive, okay? And it's going to protect you and guard you and, and keep you safe. So let's look at the word then. So the first thing is that we understand then that the word is something that we need to put into our mouth and we need to declare and speak. And that's what we see Jesus did with the word all the time. So the same thing you and I, whenever there's an onslaught or attack in our lives, when something comes against us, whichever, whatever it may be, to attack and to come against that thing and to use the word of God as an offensive weapon that you can actually bring it down. You've got to take the word of God and you've got to put it in your mouth. All right. Now, scripture also tells me that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You find the book of Matthew. So there has to be an overflow in your heart 
of that which you are convinced and convicted about. Okay, that you believe without a shadow of a doubt. So you have to have that inside of you, that God wants you to be an overcomer. God wants you to be walking perfect. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to not lack anything. God wants you to be victorious in this life, etc., etc. You have to understand and know that so you can fill your heart with the truth of the word of God. So that when the onslaught comes, the conflict comes, that you can put that word into your mouth, the excess comes into your mouth, and your mouth starts declaring and speaking that which the word of God says. And not just think about it, but speak it. Because I believe you need to hear what you say to be able to experience the, the victory that you need to walk in. All right? So you need to place that word then in your mouth and start declaring and speaking that word into your into your future and into your destiny because that is how you and I become victorious. And you say, devil, you so far no further. Because even in Mark 11, 23, 24, it says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. And it talks about the fact that you need to put the words in your mouth and you need to speak to your mountain. You need to speak to that which is coming against you. And you must believe that what which you are saying will come to pass and you will have it. That's what verse 23 tells me. So you need to understand then that you've got to take that word and you've got to place it in your mouth and you've got to start declaring and speaking. And that's what's so important to, to, to take the word and not just recite it for the sake of reciting it. That's meaningless. You declare it and because you believe it. Okay. And you've got to put faith behind it. So when I say by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed, I believe it with every single fiber of my being that there is no devil in hell that can lay any sickness on me that's going to survive or stay. So I see in the, in the, in the spirit realm, I see that when the sickness tries to attach itself to this body, the fact that it touches this body, it dies. Okay. Now, yes, sometimes some of it might get through a little bit, like with this flu now at the moment, but in Jesus name, it is bound. It is going to die and it's going to, it's going to lose this body. It's got no, it's got no authority or right in this body whatsoever. And therefore that stronghold is not going to stand. That thing is not going to survive. Why? Because of the word that's been declared and spoken over it. I choose to believe the word of God and not the circumstance or the situation. So you need to then place that into your mouth and start declaring that which the word of God says. But there's a couple of other things that you now need to learn. You, you'll see here in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, uh, 6 as well. It says, pray at all times on every occasion, every season in the spirit with all manner of prayer. So... You might say to me, but Pastor Les, how on earth is it possible that prayer can be a weapon? I don't necessarily believe that prayer is a weapon, all right? Although the Bible does tell us to resist the devil and he will flee from us, we need to pray and be anxious for nothing with prayer and supplication, make a request known unto God. So what I see in the Spirit, what I see from the Word of God, there's two aspects. Worship, prayer, and you can actually attach thanksgiving to it as well. So those three things, all right, if you look at Scripture and you can study Scripture out, they are not necessarily a weapon like a sword where you can take it and you can attack and you can, you can inflict hurt, all right? They're not like that. But what pray and what worship and what thanksgiving does, it allows God to release His spirits, angels, Holy Spirit, whoever else, heavenly hosts, whatever you want to describe them, however you want to describe them, to go and deal with the situation on our behalf. Okay. So where we are not strong enough or we do not have the weaponry or the ability to overcome and we need Father God to step in and to help us. You see that in the story of Gideon. You see Jehoshaphat. You see uh, Jericho. I mean, there are many examples in scripture where once God's people humble themselves and pray and they come down to that um, mode in God, if I can call it that, where they, they, they are surrendering their, their, uh, confidence and their hope in God. So they know and admit that, listen, Lord, I cannot do this on my own. I don't have the strength, ability, or the know-how to overcome. I surrender to you and I ask you to act on my behalf. It is that kind of mode that's established by prayer, worship, thanksgiving, and maybe a th fourth one we can throw in there is fasting. All right. So all those things show God that, Lord, I depend on you. I, I need you. I want you in my life. I cannot overcome. I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I don't have the anything to do it. I depend and trust in you. It is then that the hosts of heaven are mobilized to fight on your and my behalf. And when they are released then to go forth and to gain the victory for us, so that we don't even have to raise our hands or do anything but 
submit ourselves to the Lord. Now do you understand why prayer is so important? Do you understand why worship is so important? Do you understand why thanksgiving is so important? Do you understand why fasting is so important? But also, all these things allow us to come into a, a, a situation where we are showing our submission to God and showing our dependence on God and allowing Father to step in on our behalf into a circumstance, into a situation and allow Him to come and gain the victory for us. All right. So we need to understand the importance of this. Although it's not a weapon per se, it is something that we do. It is something that we, we go into. Now, another situation or another thing that we that we do that is not necessarily a weapon per se but it also allows us to grow faith is the whole issue about our testimony okay Romans 12 11 talks about the fact that you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the and the word of our testimony so the blood of Jesus that was shed upon the cross that blood is forever alive Okay, that blood is relevant in your my life today, even as it was 2,000 years ago. Even though you might not have been alive at that stage, that blood is carried right through all the ages. And because of that, that blood is still effective in your my life today. And when we pray and we say, Lord, we, we dependent on what is accomplished and achieved on the cross. We thank you that your blood covers us. We are protected. That blood creates the defense. And the same thing with our testimony. Because when you put your testimony into your mouth... It raises faith levels. It builds faith levels because it takes you to a level where, where even if the devil comes to try and do something to you, you say, devil, in Jesus' name, you failed once before. You're going to fail a second, a third, a fourth time. And you might as well just be reminded right now by my testimony that I've overcome here once before and I'm going to continue overcoming and you're not going to be, have a victory in Jesus' name. So you walk then in that confidence and you build faith by remembering the testimony and remembering the blood of the Lamb and appropriating that blood into your life so that you can become the over, you can be the overcomer that Christ has made you and I to be. Then another one. Let's have a look at, at this one. And this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, where it talks about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, which is above every other name. Okay, every knee has to bow and every tongue has to confess, all right, that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, so we understand that the power of his name is, is, is potent. And you and I have to invoke that in our lives as well. So we pray in the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus. Devil, in the name of Jesus, you have to bow your knee because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. And we can remind him of the fact that Jesus has already uh, has, has defeated him and overcome him and we walk in that victory. So you see, our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are spiritual. It's weapons that you and I have. And we have to understand how to use those weapons in our lives and to be able to um, invoke them and use them at the time that they are necessary. So we overcome that. But all the other stuff, things like the shield, the, the um, helmet, the belt, the breastplate, the preparation of feet of the gospel of peace, etc. All those things are protection. And those things are things that you and I need to meditate on and have our mind on. So we know the devil, my mind is you're not going to get through because I have the helmet of salvation. I am born again. I'm, I'm a child of the God. I have, he's paid the price. I have, I know that I know that I know that I'm born again, etc. The shield of faith, man, that thing quenches every fiery dart that comes and uh, towards us. Why? It's our faith in God that is faithful. He is faithful. His mercy endures forever. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. When things are impossible to us, they are possible to him. And we can bring the word into effect into our lives. And we, we use that breastplate of, of, of oh, sorry, that shield of faith to be able to overcome. Righteousness is our breastplate. And righteousness is a gift that God has given unto you. And I, when we got born again, we became the righteousness of God through Christ. And because of that, we are in right standing with him. We fulfill all the requirements of the perfect law because of what Jesus did. We can't do it in our own strength and ability. We'll never comply. We'll never be able to get up there. But there's nothing stopping us that is that we that we push. Because he said, be holy even as I'm holy. Be, be, be perfect even as I'm perfect. And we, we strive towards holiness and perfection all the time. Uh, John puts it this way. I must become less. Jesus must become more. 
So we have to work towards that all the time, continuously. So there is effort and energy required from you and I in this battle against the works of Satan. He's not just going to sit down and capitulate and lie in there in the dust and say, oh, walk all over me. No, he is, sees you and I and he is out there to kill, steal and destroy. He's going to want to take you out. He's going to want to take me out. And we have to know how to, to resist him because we already have the victory. And we need to know how to overcome in this life and stand in this life. So how do you then apply these weapons? And I've just described it to you tonight. Put the word of God in your mouth. Okay. Build up your faith. Remind yourself of your testimony. Pray to God because he is the one that gives you and I the victory anyway. So as we pray to him, we do that with thanksgiving. We do that in fasting. We do that with worship. When we do that, we create a platform and an opportunity for God to move on our behalf. Because we surrender to him and subject ourselves to him as being God Almighty. And I want to encourage you tonight. Go through this. Understand what the, the Bible says about you and I. Because you do not have to be defeated. You do not have to capitulate to the onslaught of the devil. You can fight him in every single sphere and every single area. And if you just trust God and believe God, you will come out on the other side victorious. Because he is for you and not against you. He's made a way where there seems to be no way. He will make crooked paths straight on your behalf. And you will be the victorious one because of what Jesus accomplished upon the cross. So tonight I want you to stand up and I want you to stand strong in your faith in God. All right. Do not capitulate. Do not waver. Do not allow the circumstances and situations to toss you and to throw you around in, 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 in life. But stand strong in the things of the Lord. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.